Um, all right, let's get started. Um, so I'll share my screen because I'm the first person presenting. Just give me one moment. Can everyone see my screen? Thanks. Okay. Good. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. And good evening. Um, everyone's welcome from the from different time zones. Uh, it's four a.m. here. So if you uh, hear me say something silly, please bear with me. I've had one hour of sleep. Um, so my name is Priyanka. Today I'm presenting the value of making data fair for infectious diseases, data management, and analytics. This is the first breakout BOF session of the Research Data Reliance Virtual Plenary 16. And with me today is Natalie Harrower and Mark Leggett. I should also, also mention that we are um, also the co-chairs of the RDA COVID-19 Working Group, um, and we'll be talking a bit about our work there as well. Um, <clears throat> and before I proceed, I would first like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend my respects to any indigenous or First Nations people present with us here today. Um, so a few housekeeping, I think we're all quite aware of how Zoom works now, but um, you're all on mute, I guess. Um, and please do mute your microphone if you're not speaking. We're not using Zoom webinar here, so you can interact with us using the chat function or use the raise hand function. Mark will be keeping an eye on the raise hand uh, functionality while I'm presenting and Natalie will be presenting after me. And I'll be introducing um, Natalie in a minute. Um, so, Quickly setting the scene here, um, if you could type into the chat box, what is your expectation from this session? What dragged you here? What, what attracted you to this session? Um, and what is the one thing that you're hoping to gain from the session? I'll give that a couple of minutes just to get an idea of um, what the expectation is. Sorry, I think I stopped sharing here. What happened? Yeah, all good. And I can't see the chat window while I'm presenting. So I'll just wait for people to post their comments and then have a look at it later. We are, um, we are not big on uh, num numbers today, so we don't have a lot of people. So we're not going to use breakout rooms function. Um, the workshop will be run as this one big room, um, Zoom room. Someone's asking if it would be easier to type in the Google Doc um or i can read out what comes into the chat if that helps or um yeah if you can Adley, please sure well so far there's nothing except that question okay, okay. <laughs> uh, well, one person, um here to get an overview of the topic mm -hmm. from crystal i'll say the names if they come up that's good we're also aiming to keep it fairly broad and not dive into too many jargons and specifications about infectious diseases well, Crystal, we're definitely going to do an overview. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're in the right room. Hmm. Um, uh, Jin is saying, uh, look for opportunities to collaborate. Excellent. Um, Rob is saying, as one of the authors of the FAIR principles, I thought it would be useful for me to bridge this health topic to the FAIR interest. Excellent. I think depending on our, how the workshop and the discussion goes, we'll know what the end goal would be because right now we just want to see what the interest is and um, what the uh, uptake is on this topic because we're aware that the COVID-19 working group had an excellent um, uptake. A lot of people joined, um, a lot of people contributed, but as an infectious diseases as a broad topic, It'll be interesting to see um, what happens at the end of this box session. So we're quite keen to see how this session goes. All right, I think we've got a few responses here, so I will move on. Okay. Um, so I'm Priyanka. My background is bioinformatics and computer programming. 
and I am an academic specialist at the University of Melbourne. I work as a research data specialist for Melbourne Data Analytics Platform. We work on, um, we collaborate with researchers on data intensive projects around the university across multiple domains. And I also work as a health informatics specialist for the Australian Partnership for Preparedness Research on Infectious Disease Emergencies. Um, based at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity here at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'll give a quick introduction and overview. So introduction to the session, what you can expect from the session, um, and an overview of the infectious diseases data ecosystem. Um, so a bit of context, why we've put this session together and why it's important to um, address infectious diseases as a, as a domain and, and what's going on right now in terms of information and misinformation. So there's lots of papers, lots of content out there um, that highlights both the value of data as well as what misinformation and bad data is doing right now. And as we all know, I think this is the first time everyone in the world is thinking about one thing, which is the pandemic. So uh, this is an interesting um, not a quote, but this is an interesting content that I picked up from this paper. So by analyzing trends in COVID-19 data sets, the research community rapidly helped fill in knowledge gaps around disease symptoms, risk factors, racial disparities, and more. Such observational methods also hinted at which treatments seemed to be making an impact and which were not, all in near real time. This is from the paper core concept, the pandemic is prompting widespread use and misuse of real world data. Would highly recommend checking this out when you have time. So infectious diseases data as a, as a broad concept, um, it has highlighted, so the ongoing pandemic has highlighted the importance of data-driven response. Um, public health and infectious diseases has always been a data-driven response and it has been highly topical, but it, it, it's not been, um, it hasn't been uh, a, a focal point um, beyond the pandemic. So people do focus, again, my understanding is a little bit narrow based here in Australia. Um, influenza gets a lot of importance, but infectious diseases and communicable diseases in general um, doesn't gather that much of, um, um, I mean, limelight if I were to put it that way. But the pandemic has highlighted the importance of data-driven response. Um, now we also know how data drives decisions. We know what epidemiology is. Um, everyone's following the research that's going on. We understand what infectious disease modeling is. Um, and all this has been around for quite some time, but only the pandemic has actually highlighted how these models, genomics data, lab data, clinical data, and all these different information systems feed into a response. Whether it's a peacetime response during routine research or peacetime, or whether it's during um, an epidemic or an outbreak. And it's important to think about infectious diseases data now because we want to be prepared for the next outbreak. Because as of now, in the current scenario, data has been the fuel um, or the oil that's driving the response. Um, and we want to be prepared for the next one and have as much information as possible in hand before the next pandemic happens. So the contents for today's presentation, the workshop, is I'll give a quick introduction into the ecosystem of infectious disease data. And again, keeping it very, very broad, not going deep into what each data set means and how it's collected and what happens in different sp uh, spheres of the, of the ecosystem. Uh, some reflections from the RDA COVID-19 working group and Natalie would be sharing that. Um, and then I'll come back and I'll talk a bit about the ongoing challenges, what an ideal infectious diseases data management and analytics platform would look like. And then we would get into a workshopping session um, where we'll ask people about their interest, what the domain area, um, what their domain area is, or if they are interested in a particular infectious diseases topic, um, what challenges they faced in terms of managing the data or running analytics on the data, um, and some strategies, resources, and ideas um, from people. And then we'll run a session on next steps. Um, what this BOF forms into, are we looking at an interest group, working group, um, are we looking at a community of practice? And Mark will um, get in, um, will speak to that. Um, and this is a very simple overview. Um, so there's different forms of information that feeds into the data ecosystem, the infectious disease data ecosystem. And I'm not even talking in the pandemic context here. This is even when there is not 
when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. This is routine research, this is routine surveillance, and um, these are the main sort of information um, domains of blocks that, that feed into this ecosystem. So clinical data that comprises of EMR, um, uh, medical records, um, clinical observational studies, trials data, and all forms of um, data coming out of clinical settings. Um, laboratory data, so genomics, um, diagnostics, tests, um, and other forms of um, um, diagnostical information, and even research on new diagnostics. So that's the laboratory information. Um, administra administrative data is um, information that's collected. Um, how do I put it? So. Um, we're looking at information resources that are not directly related to health here. So administrative data could be your housing information, um, employment information. And as we all know, a pandemic or infectious diseases is not just a health problem. It, it actually affects every sphere of your life. So administrative data sets is all other forms of information that's collected on you um, and from um, a person. Community participation, so the information that People contribute as people are the primary stakeholders of their data. It is their data and the information that people contribute to the ecosystem. Um, epidemiological and surveillance data, both routine and pandemic um, surveillance and epi data. Um, and data collected on vulnerable and at-risk populations. Um, there are populations who are who have been disadvantaged in previous pandemics and also when there's ongoing infectious disease um, outbreaks. So the socioeconomic data um, and both the social and health indicators of, of um, populations. So that also feeds into the ecosystem. Um, this is where my part ends. This is sort of the first, um, just an overview or introduction into the, into the ecosystem. Next up is Natalie. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll introduce um, Natalie. So Natalie is the director of the Digital Repository of Ireland, a national infrastructure for HSS um, research data, a research center for best practice in digital archiving, digital preservation, open research, and fair data management. She was a member of the EC expert group that authored Turning Fair into Reality, and is a member of the EOSC Fair Working Group and serves on all European Academies ALIAS Open Science Task Force. Um, please welcome Natalie, who will give an overview of the RDA COVID-19 guidelines and how that has fed, um, has, it will serve as a template for us to follow. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Priyanka. Okay, let me try to share my screen and hope that I get the right screen. Uh, that's the one. Is it, is it showing uh, the proper full slide there? Yes, Natalie, thank you. Okay. Great, thanks. Let's see, so um, hi to everybody. It's, uh, I'm in Dublin where the sun is just setting and it, it makes me sitting in the same desk where we worked on this uh, COVID uh, group in through the spring for uh, a number of weeks and the sun didn't set for another four hours at that point. So we are definitely going into the, the darker part of the year, um, but it's nice, to, um, it's nice to be back at one of these plenaries online. So what I'm gonna do is, is give an overview of what the RDA COVID-19 working group did. Um, and there are still activities ongoing. There's a meeting of this group during the plenary this week as well. And there are more outputs that, that keep emerging. Um, Claire has actually posted some in the chat that there are some of the, the subgroups within this group have made their own groups and are working on things as well. So it's ongoing. But what I'm gonna talk about is the output, um, what we created uh, over this time period and uh, give an overview of that because that should give uh, some kind of idea of what a group like this one, this BOF, could do if it decides to turn into a working group or that kind of thing. So the first thing is that um, the, uh, the working group was created at a at request of the European Commission. So the Commission came to the Research Data Alliance and asked them, asked us if we could put something like this together. And uh, this was an unusual procedure. Usually they come from the sort of uh, ground up. So this was different in this case. But uh, RDA being a grassroots organization, people got involved very quickly as soon as they knew what the topic was. So we set the working group up with four different research areas and then also four cross-cutting themes because we realized that there are certain topics, as you'll see when I talk about them later, that really go across the different uh, scientific research areas and they needed to be addressed as such. Uh, we had lots of teams um, meeting at all hours uh, because, you know, there were people like Mark who's in Canada, me in Ireland, Priyanka who's in Melbourne, um, trying, and then and lots of the rest of you as well, trying to meet. 
uh, chairs, moders, moderators, uh, an editorial team, visualization team, a Zotero library team. Uh, Claire was in charge of that and she's on this webinar as well. Uh, so from April 30th to, sorry, April 1st to June 30th, we had continual sprints. So the groups would work on their topics and create a new draft. Those drafts would be released openly for comment from the larger RDA community. Uh, and there'd be webinars to update everybody weekly about what was happening. And in the end, we went through six releases. And at the end of June, we came out with a final document, which is a hefty 143 pages long, uh, but lots of excellent granular detail in there, as well as higher level recommendations. There is a four page executive summary. Um, so this was a very exhilarating and unusual process, but I think really focused the minds of people in RDA during um, this pandemic as well. And there's lots of other outputs. You can go to a page called The Value of RDA for COVID-19 and you'll get that link um, and you get these slides later to see what else is happening. Okay, whoops. Um, so that's uh, the background to setting up the group. What, what really was the purpose of the group? What are the challenges that are, are being faced? And uh, so why did this group have to come together? These should be obvious to a lot of us uh, by now. In fact, I think um, Priyanka put it well, there's a, we all have a focus around the world and the pandemic, but I think there's, this has also been a moment where um, the, the general kind of educated public has an awareness of the sharing of research and the sharing of data and the importance of that because of how we're operating globally. So there's a need to share this data, a critical need to share it quickly. Um, uh, but to, you know, in terms of that being fast in how you do it, you also want to be precise to a certain level too. So there's a balance between those things. At the same time that we have this need, uh, we don't have harmonized universal standards um, and context uh, documents to share this data. There's no universally adopted system around it. So uh, faced with the need to share it quickly, but accurately not having the system, what can we do to try to bring different researchers and clinicians and um, policymakers together on this? Uh, what we essentially did is uh, we had objectives and I'll summarize these quite quickly here to say that there were two real main sides to the objectives. One was to create higher level recommendations that could be directed to governments and to, to funders, um, to infrastructure providers, uh, policymakers, to look at the systemic ways that, that they could contribute to supporting better data sharing under COVID-19, because that's the goal of the document, better research data sharing about COVID-19. So that was one side of it. And then the other side was more granular um, guidelines that could be directed at researchers, at clinicians, at data stewards, uh, and so on, um, to help them choose uh, where their data would go, how it should be prepared, how to make sure that others can find it, okay, and use it, and all of the other aspects of FAIR. So those were the two sides to it, higher level recommendations on the one hand, and then more granular detailed guidelines on the other. And when, when you look at the document, you'll see that each group did things slightly differently because of the different remits, and that makes sense, but that was the, the overall way that it's structured. So hugely interdisciplinary effort uh, to bring this kind of group together and to put these guidelines together. And that's part of, I think, what was so exciting about it. Um, and I'll just very briefly, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail on these, but you know, here are across the top, the four different research areas that we had groups on. So there was one uh, on clinical data, one on omics. So that brings together genomics, proteomics, metabolomics. Um, so looking at the uh, functioning of the virus, as well as its interaction with the host, um, epidemiology, uh, and, um, and then also the social sciences, which uh, was a sort of category bringing several other things together in terms of how we handle um, the virus and the responses to it and research around those responses of, and their effectiveness from the social science perspective. And then we also had four groups that, as I mentioned before, were kind of cross-cutting or overarching. Uh, one of those was community groups. So how do the, you know, data that emerges from the public and the involvement of that contact tracing apps, that sort of thing. Research software, very clear that if we're creating a lot of data, um, there's software behind uh, the, the way that data is being um, put together and analyzed that is necessary for continuing to understand it and be able to work with it. So, so what do we do, need to do to make sure we share that? Um, we also had a group on indigenous data guidelines um, and how data from Indigenous communities should be dealt with and how Indigenous communities 
should be involved in the processing of their data and, and other activities around the research to do with COVID-19. Again, I think this is one of the, the great benefits of having an interdisciplinary worldwide, uh, sorry, a, um, an international community involved, uh, thinking about uh, more broadly of the different communities that are affected in different ways by COVID-19. And then the last one, but not least, was a legal and ethical considerations group that looked across everything that was um, happening in the document and in the working groups to be consistent in terms of advice around um, different uh, guidelines and conventions to pay attention to, uh, how licensing should be handled, consent, and, and that kind of thing. So just to dive in slightly deeper and give you a flash look at what the document appeared like, I'll show an example from the omics side. So this is um, from uh, section 4.4.2. <laughs> very well ordered our document, um, guidelines for host genomic data. And then you can see here in this, this example that this is really, um, I have this kind of data, what repository should I put it in? What is the best place for um, metadata to be provided and contextual information to make sure that um, it's, it's suitable and that others can find it? Um, so this, this is the, the level of granularity you see in some of the guideline side of the document. And then if we look at, uh, for example, the legal and ethical considerations, here's an example. And this is from a, a section on consent and the importance of gaining uh, consent for data that is, um, that's being collected at the time so that it can be used, but it can also be used down the chain again for other kinds of research that may be relevant. And you can see here just at the top, there's advice around uh, consent in clinical situations, around data protection, around research environments, um, so this cross cut through the different research areas. So I'm coming to the end here. Um, what we did is uh, we, we went through, the editorial team was kind of tasked with looking at what all of the different groups were doing and trying to cull from that some of the recommendations that appeared frequently. So um, instead of going to every section and reading that they say you should create fair data, which was the case um, across all the sections. Uh, we decided to pull some of those um, kind of higher level or overarching or common, common to the different groups uh, guidelines into or recommendations into the first part of the document. So I won't go through all of these, but I will point out a few things that I think are important to the undertaking that uh, Priyanka really has uh, is working on today with this BOF. One, the, the top thing that we noted, and, and I think this is really interesting because it doesn't always come up as first when we're talking about fair data, is the need to coordinate cross-jurisdictional efforts around global science, to around, sorry, open science from a global perspective, to how do we um, take the work that we're doing, which may be very well developed um, in some cases or some domains in different jurisdictions, and make sure that those can talk to each other as well. And that is a really big task. Um, there is a global open research commons um, uh, group as well in RDA that is looking at some of these issues, but this came out very specifically in terms of the pandemic because you can't get more global than the pandemic as, as an example around data sharing. So that's one thing to note, but then also um, uh, there was a, we talked about having a data first policy. This is number two there. So get your data out there in a sense um, uh, as soon as possible and that needs to be incentivized. Um, and that may be before the publication comes out, uh, but you know, um, with proper context, then people can assess uh, how they may want to reuse that data. And then if you look at number four, you'll see uh, right there, there is the mention of the FAIR principles. Now the FAIR principles came up a lot. Um, in fact, I would say, uh, if you look through the other recommendations that we have here at the high level, quite a few of them actually do relate to FAIR as well. So number six is about using generic and common, uh, as well as domain specific metadata standards and persistent identifiers, that folds right into FAIR perfectly. Uh, number seven, documentation context. So not just sort of basic data, uh, metadata, but make it as rich as possible and provide the other documentation when you can. Um, the use of trustworthy data repositories that are committed to preservation and are um, robust. Um, something that's also mentioned in the FAIR principles, uh, you know, same goes for access being as open as possible, as close as necessary, and legal frameworks that promote the sharing of, of data across jurisdictions 11 and 12. They're looking at things around licensing and openness and that sort of thing, which get discussed under the FAIR principles as well. So 
um, by focusing this BOF on infectious diseases uh, and the model and FAIR, Prank has been bringing together um, some of the really key elements that came out of this working group. And I should note there were over 600 people that signed up for this working group um, and got involved at various levels. In the end, the, uh, the number of actual contributing authors was 160 and change, I think. Um, so a lot of people involved in putting this together from all different kinds of disciplines. So um, I think it provides a very good starting point for seeing where we can go further on infectious diseases in, in general in a global context. And I don't think there's any better place for that than RDA, really, as, uh, as all of you out there at various times of the day, some, some, uh, some of us, some of you probably cursing the hour that you have to be awake at, <laughs> will know very well. Um, so this is my last page. You can find out more about the group by going to this one central page, the value of RDA for COVID-19. Um, that's that first link that I put there. All the related outputs to do with the group are on that page. There's a direct link to the full recommendations and guidelines if you want to take a look through it. There are some tools that we're working on for navigating that as well, and there's some of those are already available on the page. Uh, executive summary. And then very recently, uh, as part of the Funders Forum, which took place last week as a pre-plenary event, um, a couple of the co-chairs on the uh, working group, myself and Ingrid Dilo, put together uh, specific recommendations to funders. Um, and these are the kinds of outputs we're going to continue, things that address different audiences. Um, and I think that's the, yes, I'm clicking and there's nothing more. So that is the end. I'll stop sharing. And I will send it back to Priyanka. Thanks, Natalie. Um, it was it, it's a bit of a surreal moment because I had put together this abstract to um, focus on how we can make infectious diseases data fair and what what it means for responses before the pandemic started. So for the last plenary, and then ended up working on the COVID nineteen working group where everything was sort of real. It it all became real and it was not just an abstract concept. And then we've actually seen the outputs. We've seen what what impact that a collective community effort has when everyone is thinking about how to make data sharing better, how to make the best use of data, how to get the maximum research um, and information gain out of it. So that has been a truly rewarding experience. And thanks, Natalie, for um, presenting an excellent overview. Um, so I'll bring things back a little bit to the broader infectious disease context and share my screen here. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yes, looks good. You're on slide three. Slide three, excellent. There's three there, yep. So um, the next part is a platform. So the infectious diseases data management and analytics platform, again, a very abstract concept, um, an acronym that I put together because I think in Australia, everyone loves to do that. Um, so this is just trying to understand what an enabling platform. So a platform, ideal platform that would bring together different types of infectious diseases data, um, manage the data, and then that platform would enable the analytics and what that platform would look like. Um, but before that, what are some of the challenges in, in infectious diseases, data analytics and management? And these are some broad challenges and they're not very different from what Natalie just highlighted uh, from the RDA COVID-19 working group. Uh, but I think um, I'll try and give examples if I can, just to make it, again, I will have to talk about COVID because that's the most topical thing, but um, just in general, how these challenges actually impact the analytics and management. And then we would look at what an ID DMA platform should look like. Um, so what are some of the biggest challenges and not just COVID, but infectious disease data in general? So under data management, um, the biggest challenge is harmonization and standardization. Um, so if I were to give an example here, um, the, the CT values actually measuring the amount of virus um, when samples are taken from um, people who are who go into testing, CT values can be different across different regions and at, at the threshold can be different at, in different regions. So someone who tests positive in one region may be a weak positive in the other region or maybe even negative in, in another region. So that level of inconsistency is, is quite critical to decision-making because um, as we all know that a one positive test or one negative test is actually making a huge difference at the policy level. Um, and that's lack of information capturing, um, lack of standardization and information capturing, as well as setting those benchmarks, thresholds, and um, guidelines. That's one example. And also um, in, in the clinical observational studies, 
um, the uh, so the ICU hours that are recorded or you know the 24 hour window it could start at different time points in different regions which makes it challenging to compare information across different regions and then you can't do a comparison if the if the definitions are not standard if the thresholds are not standard um, and they're not harmonized. Um, lack of pre-approved data collection and sharing protocols. So when I say pre-approved, pre-approved by bodies such as WHO, um, the jurisdictional governing, governing bodies, um, and those data collection and sharing protocols should be pre-approved. Um, the, the research value and the information gain should be clearly specified and not during the pandemic, but before um, the pandemic starts. So we don't have those standardized pre-approved data collection and sharing protocols. Um, the ethical and legal landscape is quite complex. Um, and again, I try and keep those two things separate because they are. Um, and um, just because collecting data from a certain setting is legal doesn't always make it ethical, if that makes sense. So just understanding where the ethical boundaries are and what the legal boundaries allow you to do or not allow you to do. And also um, the legal landscape in the context of a pandemic is also not very clear. And our, the, the RDA COVID-19 guidelines have, have captured that really well. But we do need sort of an emergency um, legislation, whether it's a jurisdiction level, whether you it's from the regional level, or whether at a global level. What, what does the landscape tell us? What does the legal requirement, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the legal requirement to share data, not just data, but also specimens, because that has also been quite a, a challenging um, area of work. Um, data management practices, are, like I said, the, these challenges have been around for quite some time now. I mean, I haven't been around long, but um, I can, um, I've spoken to people who have been around for decades and they said not much has changed. 2009 pandemic happened, we were still grappling with the same issues. 2020 happened, we're still grappling with the same issues, but at different scales. Some things have changed, it's not all that bad, but still there are some issues that have just not changed. So it's a domain um, specific problem and it takes time for things to change and hopefully just the scale of this current pandemic gives me a bit of hope that things might change but we'll see. Um, building capacity during preparedness phase and um, probably I've spoken about this in so many different um, forums that preparedness is the key, preparedness is the key because we we can actually start preparing now for the next pandemic um, and be be much better prepared. So this is data management. So in terms of data analytics and obviously data management feeds into analytics. So lack of harmonization and standardization then feeds into the lack of standardized analytical tools and protocols, um, skills and infrastructure. There's obviously we don't have, um, there's not an equal distribution of skills and infrastructure across the world. Uh, there are some regions who have more advantage um, in terms of skills and infrastructure and they end up doing more analytics and producing more results and outputs. Um, bad quality data, um, it, it is a challenge, but I do feel that there's the balance between getting the data quickly and getting it in the perfect format, not just during a pandemic, but also during routine um, surveillance. So if I were to give an example of influenza here, influenza season lasts for a few months. And at that point, it's important to gather as much information as you can during that period and keep informing the public health activities, keep informing the regular reporting systems, and at the same time, prepare that information, that uh, prepare that information for vaccine, um, uh, vaccine uh, design for the next year. That's how the whole influenza surveillance cycle works. Again, not an expert here in, in, in vaccine, um, vaccine development, but just the cycle of information, that's how it works. Um, bespoke tools and software. So for analytics purposes, if, um, the priority is to get the outputs out of the priority is to get the results and that leads to people developing bespoke, bespoke tools and software which will work for them but then the whole reproducibility aspect is missing um, and lack of collaborative platforms so um, there are a bunch of platforms that are coming up now that would enable people to collaborate but at the same time this is not something that has happened before where infectious diseases data was was being fed into a, a national or an international collaborative platform if I give an example of genomics, genomics is something that people are more comfortable with. People have done that before. Um, and there's a certain level of threshold that needs to be met before your data is contributed to a global platform. Um, and that is something people have been more comfortable with. They've done it. But in terms of epi data, we don't know what the threshold is. We don't know how much we can um, 
how much we can share and how much we shouldn't share because differential privacy is a different concept as well. How much um, in terms of regions, how many people there are, there's lots of sensitivities about sharing epidemiological data. So without epi data, we cannot look at a collaborative um, infectious diseases platform, um, analytics and management platform, data management platform. Again, capacity here is, is a big problem. So understanding that we need to build capacity for analytics during the preparedness phase and not when we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so this is an ideal world. Again, I'm quite keen on hearing other people's thoughts here. So these are the four um, key topics that, not topics, but key features that have emerged out of not just the COVID-19 working group, but also a lot of conversations that I've had with people um, and what um, data specialists and data management specialists and data stewards feel like. So harmonization has come up so many times and we do need a platform that um, has a, a quality check in place that only accepts data that's harmonized and if not has some sort of harmonization or integration engine built into the platform that helps with harmonization and again those th that is more of a, of a group effort of a community effort people contributing data from different sources um, will need to help with that um, it should be underpinned by fair principle and that's that's needless needless to say we want data assets to be findable Otherwise, there's no way people will know um, where the information assets are sitting. And that's again, metadata, um, making sure that the data assets have rich metadata, they're findable, um, and that actually keeps up with the ongoing research as well. So if I were to again give an example here, the symptoms that were in, with respect to COVID-19, um, the surveillance modules kept changing depending on the symptoms that came that the new symptoms that were recorded so loss of taste loss of loss of loss of smell um, that's something that was discovered a bit later and that information started getting recorded a bit later but then that kept feeding into um, community participation people who were uh, giving their data or people who were filling out survey forms and surveillance and other things. So that improves the findability because we know that the respiratory diseases that is not COVID did not have this particular symptom, but this metadata that feeds into it, that we're recording different types of symptoms um, and it's not the same as influenza um, makes these data assets more findable, if that makes sense. Um, and accessibility, we've talked about how the platform should be equitable, it should be accessible across different jurisdictions, across different settings, different sectors. Um, interoperability, again, harmonization, standardization would improve in interoperability. It's a big aspect of having a unified platform. Um, and reproducibility is very important uh, from the preparedness perspective as well. Um, cross-jurisdictional, and not just cross-jurisdictional, but cross-sectoral as well. And, I've mentioned this before that infectious diseases is not just a health problem. It affects everything. When the communicable diseases start spreading, when there's, a, there's an outbreak, when there's an epidemic, when there's a pandemic, it impacts all aspects of our lives. So it's important for the information uh, silos um, to then connect to each other, whether it's social sciences, humanities, health. Um, and ethically approved and fast track, the protocol word is missing there, sorry, but I mean, ethically approved and fast track data collection and data management um, protocols. So with that, we have covered what the ecosystem looks like, a bit of a taster there. Natalie has covered what the RDA COVID-19 working group did, which was a massive community-led, community-driven effort to produce guidelines and recommendations on data sharing during this pandemic. I have talked a bit about infectious diseases um, and challenges associated with infectious diseases, which again feeds um, back into what we recorded in the um, COVID-19 working group and what an ideal platform would look like. So in the workshop, we are not doing breakout rooms today because we don't have a lot of people, which is good. We can just stay here. We can all see each other and we can record people's responses. Um, and um, I'll be taking notes and we can, because we, I've shared the collaborative notes file, we can all take some notes um, and we can discuss what is infectious diseases data in your area of research. And you don't necessarily have to be from public health or infectious diseases data. Any kind of infectious disease data that you come in contact with um, or work with, or just your, if it's your interest area, we want to know that. Um, any specific challenges that you have experienced or any of your colleagues have experienced and you as a data specialist or someone who has interest in data is aware of that and want to highlight that. 
Um, and the third thing that we want to cover is strategies. So ideas, solutions, shareable resources, anything from any other domain that we might be able to capture in infectious diseases and learn from that. All those thoughts are, are welcome. Um, so I'm not sure what the best way to do it, this is. I can stop sharing my screen and I can post these points into the chat window and then we can start the discussion. Mark, Natalie, what do you think? Yeah, I think if um, you can even share your screen if you want, uh, Priyanka, with the notes uh, document. But uh, as you suggested, I think they're with um, 18 of us, including mm -hmm. the three uh, facilitators. I think we probably would be just as well served with one breakout. And I thought maybe to get things started, what I can do is is uh, if people uh, can keep this kind of initial remarks to one to two minutes and respond to any of those three questions, the, the data question, the challenge question, or the strategies question. And these are also repeated uh, in the document. Uh, so I would suggest we can just keep notes in breakout session one in the notes document, Priyanka. So what I'm gonna do is call on each person and just introduce yourself, uh, who, your name and your role at your institution. And then just a couple of comments as you feel appropriate on either of those three. And then we'll come back and I'll probe in more detail on each of the additional ones, depending on what people's comments are. So feel free to introduce yourself and then make a comment on the data that's uh, most common in your area challenges that you've experienced in the context of data sharing and strategies that you see facilitating this moving forward. So uh, why don't we start with you, Rob? Yeah, thank you. So uh, my name is Rob Hoofd. I work for the Dutch Tech Center for Life Sciences in the Netherlands and Elixir in the Netherlands. Um, uh, allow me to digress a little bit or to, to retreat one step further than the three questions. And um, what, what we've been uh, calling this in the uh, RDA COVID-19 group, I think is emergency response. And emergency response is, I think, one, uh, one step broader than, uh, than what we are pursuing here as a platform. And um, I think it is useful to uh, to place it in a context to see whether we actually need a platform for emergency response or uh, that, and I can imagine that uh, from Priyanka's initiative that uh, we uh, we want it specifically for uh, pandemics or uh, uh, for disease. Um, yeah, uh, in the three questions, the most important thing that, that came to my mind, so I'm, I'm not a practicing researcher, I am uh, doing uh, support for uh, for data management for a lot of people. Um, uh, what I saw is the word harmonization. And for me, harmonization is only the third step uh, in, in solving the problem. So the first thing you want to have if you have a well-prepared platform is actually a, 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 fur, a good definition of what people are doing. So instead of just saying we measure the amount of death deaths from COVID-19, you actually have to have a definition of when you see it is a death of COVID-19. Uh, social media are full of people that are denying uh, this by just saying, well, you know, it's a death with instead of a death of uh, and the other way around. So this is this is essential also for the, uh, for the before harmonization. And then when there are multiple ways of defining and you're still in a prepar preparatory phase, then you can make choices and decide to do things one way in different countries. And only when that has failed, you need to go and harmonize data in the emergency response phase. I think that is uh, that is important. So that, that was my first I think The second uh, that I want to do is only one sentence. I think under ethically approved, the data sovereignty is important to, uh, to keep uh, in mind. And uh, with that, I'll give it over to the next person. Okay, and I'm gonna call each person just in the order I have them on my screen here, uh, Andrew. Hey everyone, uh, I do not have any experience with infectious disease, but uh, 
I'm uh, interested in data repositories. I work for Figshare, which is a um, data repository platform. And I guess, uh, you know, I'm attending this session because I'm interested in how I think it's definitely an emerging and big, uh, big thing going on with COVID-19, of course. People are more aware of it. I'm interested in how current, like existing repository structures uh, help or, or don't help infectious disease data needs. Um, so I'm looking to just to learn and uh, kind of listen to what everybody's uh, sharing, take some notes. Perfect, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Claire? Uh, Claire, I don't know if you're speaking because you don't have the video on. Oh, there yeah, you go. I had to <laughs> had to look for my unmute button. Sorry. Um, you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is a really, really um, good, um, a good, a really good group. Very, very timely, as you all know, um, and. Uh, intersects really very, very nicely with the, um, the new uh, RDA, oh, I keep forgetting the title, uh, <laughs> but, uh, RDA uh, uh, Common Standard for Surveillance Data. Um, we're calling it communicable disease, but infectious disease is uh, essentially the same. Um, and if I understand correctly, this, inter this interest group is focusing more on the platform uh, aspect of, of uh, fair uh, infectious disease data. And we, we, were, we had a meeting last week and we're, we, were, we're, we were discussing that um, even with uh, the best, uh, most comprehensive standard and wide adoption, um, it, it's not going to be successful without uh, uh, also uh, building a, a platform. Um, uh, so <laughs> th this is this this works out really very very well I think um, it's it's huge uh, both the 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 work uh, is is enormous to develop uh, a, a common standard uh, a common data standard for for reporting surveillance data uh, and also uh, huge for um, when, when we're talking about a a platform um, so. One of the one of the um, uh, important things to do, I think, straight off the bat, is to try and zero in on exactly what we want to do and achieve, what our objectives are, and how to and how they relate and intersect with each other. Um, we we're also talking about how this uh, situates uh, very nicely with the CoData uh, Decadal program um, and putting it in that context also. Sorry, okay. I think I went over the two minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, the advantage to a small group is everybody has a few words. So uh, if we can keep them uh, brief, and that oh, you, was, brief. That was you want, brief. You wanted me to say who, uh, so I, I work for the government of Canada, the Department of the Environment, uh, and I, um, I, uh, I co-chaired the epidemiology uh, um, subwork group for the RDA COVID-19. And... Um, and I'm also leading the this new work group for a common data standard, and um, I'm I'm not an infectious disease expert, uh, but my PhD is from um, uh, from the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and uh, Occupational Health at McGill. All right, thanks, Claire. Uh, Brian. Hi there. Uh, my name is Brian Corey. I'm from Simon Fraser University in, in Vancouver. Um, I'm involved in an immune genetics uh, project, and we've been working on curating COVID-19 data. So I'm very interested in this space. Um, I think my main comment was is that I think uh, sharing, even sharing one type or class of data. So we we uh, work with data that is around genomics of the immune response. Um, even that is challenging enough and it's just one type of data um, and I think going beyond that I think is very challenging even for the researchers to be able to take advantage of even if it's a chicken and egg thing I think we have a even if we could provide a platform that would do it I think because researchers haven't been able to do it before it's still very very challenging for people to wrap their head around what they could do with it if they had such a platform so I think that's 
that's one of the big challenges, I think. Okay, thanks, Brian. And I should highlight, and you can, I would think of platform, and I don't know what Priyanka's original intention was in using the term platform, but RDA commonly, frequently uses the term platform to refer to the, the social as well as computer and other mechanisms that RDA uses to bring people together to discuss common problems. So, and I know many of us, Brian uh, and myself in particular, and I'm sure others are used to thinking of a platform as a particular software platform. But I think if there, if we try to think of it as that former one, you know, community of like-minded folks with a common interest, um, that might help our subsequent conversation. And if I if I don't pronounce your name properly, I apologize, uh, Fajin. Sorry, you're muted. There you go. Sorry. All right, uh, my name is Hua Jing Lam. I'm a librarian at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries and also uh, program director for open science and data collaborations. Um, my, I, my PhD training was actually not related to <laughs> like libraries at all. I was a cell biologist by training and I worked a lot with the imaging data and omics types, uh, types of data. So my interest is um, primarily on the data reuse, how to make data more reusable. Um, so a lot of effort recently, um, I organized a conference called uh, AI for data discovery and reuse. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of researchers come and present their in multiple disciplines, how they share data and using AI try to make the data, ex for example, extract metadata, make the data uh, more somehow more reusable but often um, the conversation landed on, it's, it's a feed forward loop, right? So at first you need to make the metadata um, better and machine readable and human readable uh, before the AI can do anything. Um, and then you use AI to sort of refine the data and make, make the data better. So I'm very interested in uh, this type of work in this uh, space, just how to maybe by, uh, uh, along the lines of metadata and data harmonization, just make the data more re reusable. Um, and as for infectious diseases, I just think it's a very timely topic. So I'm re really interested. Great, Thank you. thanks for joining. Uh, Dimitri? Hi. Um, uh, thanks for letting me in this in this group is my first RDA. So I thought I just uh, peacefully connect and learn, uh, but uh, I realized that this is the round of introduction. So I do mine very quickly. I'm a scientific officer in GBIF, Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Uh, and I heard from many of my colleagues uh, that RDA is uh, a really cool series of open data and in data infrastructure events. So it took me a while to register, but here I am. So uh, I'm interested in the in the in the topic um, of today for three reasons. Uh, a couple of years ago, I initiated um, a program of open data advocacy for biodiversity. Uh, it's called Biodiversity Open Data Ambassadors. I know RDA has own ambassadors, so this is like an unfortunate terminological overlap. But the mission is that we have very advanced speakers who can um, basically convince hesitating or skeptical researchers into the open data mindset. And so they start sharing their data. Um, in that context, uh, we started a task group on mobilization of data on uh, vectors, hosts and reservoirs or wild species that, that could carry uh, human, disease, um, human disease pathogens. And uh, so we are just starting and we managed to collect a group of experts uh, who will be thinking what's the order of disease, what's the priority. And uh, I can just tell you that COVID and um, sort of hot topic um, reactions, uh, it's, um, it's, it's carried out uh, uh, by so many other groups, by CTAF, by CODATA and so on and so on. So I think it will be longer term, more peaceful, but nevertheless important endeavor so we will we'll see more of mosquito tick mollusk bat and uh, sand fly and so on data out in the open data uh, landscape using the existing standards and the existing platforms so i'm i'm a content enthusiast i think 
invention and connecting is very important, but we should we should do so much with the things we have already now. So Great. this is what I'm this is what I'm coordinating. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. And that that kind of your last remarks described RDA quite well. Uh, Crystal. Hi, um, I'm Crystal. Um, I'm a research data specialist from the University of Melbourne here in Australia. And much like Andrew, um, I sort of don't know a lot about the topics that are here for um, uh, to, to get an overview um, and some um, background. Um, uh, and obviously, because some, um, you know, the, the the work is so timely and, and so important. Um, so I probably don't have a lot to contribute in terms of the questions posed in the chat. Um, but yeah, very, very much here for, yeah, that kind of uh, general interest at this point, yeah. Well, and I appreciate Crystal and Priyanka and I think Andrew and maybe one or two others joining us at a, a crazy hour in Australia and that time zone. So thanks for that, uh, Alex. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's just gone five in Melbourne. Um, uh, like Priyanka and Crystal, I work at the Melbourne Data Analytics Platform as an academic specialist. Um, so this is somewhat beyond um, my area of specialty, but I'm very interested in learning more about how the um, FAIR principles can be applied to um, infectious disease data. So here to learn from you all and yeah, thanks. Thank you. And our last one, because I see we had a couple of people log out, Mervyn. Not sure if I pronounced your name correctly. You're, you're muted in case you are speaking. Okay. Um, so maybe, uh, Mervyn, if uh, you are able to enable your audio, then just uh, interrupt me if you have something you want to add. So I think the good thing about the conversation we just had is it does illustrate the range of interests and experiences and uh perspectives uh in this ecosystem and that kind of brings us around to the kind of the one of the reasons for calling this group together is to try and figure out how to provide that platform context uh to move the conversation forward that context being infectious disease and and the uh, the priorities uh, that uh, Priyanka had highlighted so um before I kind of move us forward to talk a little bit about how RDA works and what it might mean to kind of in terms of next step, which we definitely want to talk about before the session ends. Does anybody have any other particular comments to add in terms of the types of data in your network, uh, specific challenges that aren't listed in the notes that were taken here or strategies uh, on how to facilitate data sharing in the context? So any other kind of general remarks in the context of those three questions? Oh, it's Claire here. Um, you mentioned genomics. I'm, I'm wondering um, uh, to what extent you think that uh, the uh, genomics platforms that have been developed uh, could be a, a model uh, to work from. Okay, so genomics as a model, genomics platforms. Um, and Priyanka highlighted, I forgot to introduce myself, um, just to give my own context. Uh, so I'm the executive director for Research Data Canada and also co-chair with my colleague Ingrid Dillo from the Netherlands for RDA's council, which is kind of the uh, overall governing body for RDA. Uh, I also chair the Code Data's International Data Policy Committee and I'm co-chair for a few RDA groups. So my interests uh, is pretty broad, typically high level, uh, but I, I guess you could say my primary day job is to bring people together to create connections to facilitate uh, solutions and outcomes in terms of best practices for data management, uh, which is part of the reason why this one uh, is of such interest to me. And also the fact that I did work with Priyanka and Natalie and, and others, including Claire and Rob on the RDA COVID-19 data sharing guidelines. Um, so feel free to put a physical hand up or a virtual hand up if you want to interrupt me at any point here, but I'm going to cruise down in our notes to page six. 
um, which is where there is a, a table uh, that describes the, the differences between the different types of groups in the RDA context. Um, and I did want to focus in on this one just for a few minutes um, because I think it comes back to an, Priyanka's earlier comments about a platform as well as some other comments and we'll give especially the newcomers a sense of how RDA works. Uh, so the work that Natalie described in terms of the COVID-19 uh, group, that is a what RDA traditionally calls a working group. The big difference between that working group and a typical working group um, is that the COVID-19 group was, was pulled together and created an output in the course of basically two months, two to three months. Normally a working group has uh, 12 to 18 months to meet and ruminate and discuss and produce an output. Um, so that, that just to kind of highlight that as a somewhat a bit of a, an outlier in terms of how RDA would normally work in terms of timeline. So having said that, working from the right-hand column in this table over, the way RDA typically works is, is a group expresses an interest in gathering and discussing common interests and potentially or typically at some point producing an output. So this session is a birds of a feather session. And that's often how uh, other types of groups in RDA are created and started. Um, the, the other one is the, um, uh, working group, which is the one I described with the COVID-19 work. Any one of these three or four types of groups can, can happen uh, kind of organically and come from conversations of the stakeholder community. So there's no kind of linear progression from a birds of a feather to an interest group or working group, et cetera. Uh, but this table just kind of gives you a sense of the differences. So working groups typically have a 12 to 18 month timeline and the end of that timeline, they produce an output, which could be a white paper or sample code or an actual platform as in a traditional software platform kind of context. An interest group, and when that working group has completed their effort, then they typically either disband or they redefine themselves to kind of carry on with another 12 to 18 month uh, life cycle of, of effort. And they may well also keep themselves uh, around and live in order to maintain an output if it's the kind of output that requires uh, updating and maintenance. An interest group is exactly what you would think. It's a group of like-minded people that gather, discuss things. There's no timeline as to when an interest group starts or ends. Uh, and it simply reflects, again, a group of like-minded individuals uh, who come together. Uh, the fourth one, which is communities of practice, is, is a brand new concept. Uh, in the RDA community. And it's again, another, it's a goal. The goal is to kind of grow on the BOF interest group, working group kind of efforts to reflect, largely reflect a domain specific interest. So community of practice, like an interest group is a group of people who share a concern or passion for something they do and wanna learn how to do it better as they interact uh, regularly. The big difference is communities of practice and um, umbrella groups are bringing together uh, people who are coordinating the, who potentially can coordinate the work of other interest groups and working groups in a specific domain or, or discipline or context. And that coordinating interaction of that domain or discipline specific uh, context is the critical aspect of a, communities of a community of practice. Um, and each community of practice, once it gets underway, will typically have one or more interest groups and or working groups that kind of function within that community of practice or are the, the, the target, if you will, of the facilitating coordinating effort of that community of practice. One of the big challenges in RDA, especially for folks that are new, is there are over a hundred working groups and interest groups uh, we, and we don't even count birds of a feather in that 100. So typically at any given plenary, there might be 120-ish uh, of these different groups. So one of the challenges is how do you, from a discipline specific context, derive the value or understand even the value that can be pulled from any of those 100 plus interest groups and working groups. 
So as the COVID-19 effort got underway, um, it, it kind of galvanized the thinking that the RDA team had been undertaking in the last little while. And that was exemplified by one of the very early communities in RDA's uh, lifespan, and that is the agriculture uh, interest group. Uh, it's called IGAD, or the Interest Group for Agricultural Data. So that group has been around since the beginning, and it's one of the very few kind of disciplinary groups that RDA has stewarded over the years. And it's a kind of an exemplary example of a community of practice before we had that designation, because in that IGAD context, there are a number of other interest groups and working groups that work together and are coordinated by that kind of higher level agricultural data interest group. So one of the thoughts we had, and when I was speaking with Priyanka, uh, as she mentioned, when she had proposed a, a BAH on infectious disease uh, for Melbourne, was that it might lend itself very naturally to the opposite side of creating a community of practice than what we saw with the agriculture group, which was a, ma a mature group that helped form the framework that we call the community of practice framework. In this case, we would have a brand new group that would use that current, still currently draft governance document and framework for defining a community of practice and build one from scratch. Um, so that's one of the thoughts uh, that we have. Um, other people on the call, Claire, for example, has mentioned that there's another epidemiology uh, working group that's kind of moving ahead in the current plenary context and again coming from that COVID-19 working group effort. Um, so that's kind of the background that I wanted to provide in terms of how RDA works and introduce this idea of communities of practice uh, to this group so we can have a, an open discussion about the potential interest or value uh, in that option or do we see starting with an interest group or a working group or continuing the conversation uh, in some other context. So that's the, that's the background piece. Um, so I'll just kind of open it up. I don't know if Natalie or Priyanka had any other comments. Uh, otherwise, we'll just open it up in general to get people's thoughts on how you, you think we might proceed in terms of um, next steps and specific strategies for moving the uh, communicated interest forward. I mean, I would maybe Priyanka, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but <laughs> it's your idea. So um, would you speak, because Mark mentioned that the, he differentiated ideas of what a platform is, you know, and yes. speaking about platform as a social platform as well. So um, would you speak more to what you've, a little bit more about the, the idea of the platform? Um, because that seemed to be the core thing mm. That differentiated this group in some ways from from approaching similar topics but uh you know with different goals in mind um yeah that that makes a lot of sense natalie that's true so um as mark said that there's two different kinds of there's two definitions of platform here basically so there's the social infrastructure um that and a framework that supports the management of data and the analytics of data and then there's the technical infrastructure um i think what i'm looking at is both a bit of both so a community driven effort to create the social infrastructure because that I, I feel like the technological infrastructure is the easier part here that's a, an easier problem to solve but uh, the social infrastructure um, the sort of uh, community driven efforts that's required that is is more important than the technical one because once we have the social infrastructure in place once we have the harmonization in place once we have a, a robust idea of what the platform would look like and consensus actually more than anything else and drawing the value out of the platform i think then getting the infrastructure bit is the easier part um, and like i said the data management issues once they are resolved i think the analytics then becomes easy yeah and there certainly are examples of the one that comes to mind is but, uh, the fair sh what's now known as fair sharing which started as a bio sharing group and their goal was to discuss the various kind of requirements for 
fair infrastructure and the minimal kind of standards and best practices that would be associated with attaching uh, the name of a fair compliant or the name phrase fair compliant to an existing piece of infrastructure. So they started with the kind of the general conversation and then evolved into actually producing a, a pilot software platform, which then became uh, what we now know as fair sharing, uh, which is a well-maintained and important uh, software platform in the community. So I think it can, as Priyanka suggests, it, it can certainly evolve uh, or it can certainly move forward as both. You know, having that the social piece to bring all the thoughts and ideas together on how you might, for example, have a best practices platform that demonstrates how you support all of these things, I think is a good a good example of how, how something like this could evolve. Mark, do you think this is something that can start off as a community of practice, then form into a working group and then feed into the sort of technical infrastructure or technical definitions and standards? Oh, for sure. Um, one of the conversations that the council and the other RDA governing bodies are having around a community of practice is, does it derive from an existing group, like a working group or interest group, or can't start from scratch? Uh, so to my mind, um, even though it wasn't your original intention, uh, Priyanka, as you highlighted in your remarks, the COVID-19 working group does provide a convenient opportunity with which, from which to spawn a community of practice. So moving from that specific lens of COVID-19 to the broader set of lenses for infectious disease, um, I think we could still think of this, a community of practice in this context as stemming from that original COVID-19 working group effort. Uh, in which case we create a community of practice and then that community of practice can spin off interest groups. They can coordinate or work with existing interest groups. Uh, they can spin off or coordinate efforts with working groups. Uh, so it's the, the thing we're looking for in RDA in terms of communities of practice is how do, we, how do we make the efforts of RDA in a disciplinary context more meaningful uh, and produce the kinds of outputs that a community of practice is interested in given the complexities of you know the traditional uh, set of interest groups and working groups and all the other things that RDA does. So is it safe to assume that we can see community of practice as a broad umbrella and then under this umbrella there's different pathways that can operate so even for infectious diseases say for example Claire mentioned genomics right so how genomics can actually act as, and Rob is better placed to, to respond to this, how genomics can actually um, be seen as a learning example because um, of how mature the data sharing practices are. So that forms a, a component of the community of practice um, yeah. because the metadata and standards are more mature, but then there's another aspect like epidemiology where it's still, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So then that forms a different pathway. Absolutely. So the community practice practice becomes a broad umbrella term or a framework under which different pathways can operate. Yeah. Yeah, and if you look, I mean, both communities, some people have said, what's the difference between a community of practice and an interest group? And the simple response is the community of practice is intended to be kind of anchored in a discipline or a particular domain context, whereas an interest group is just that. It's, it doesn't specific, typically address a particular uh, discipline or domain of practice. So RDA has traditionally strayed away from having all of these various disciplinary efforts evolve. So community of practice is a, is a way to do that and have it go through the, the normal RDA processes in order to come up with the, you know, the outputs that the, that the group is interested in. And one of the things I was going to ask a question about was the, the scope of kind of what you're talking about, because I think you just mentioned a couple of interesting things because they are in some ways quite different. The epidemiology side of infectious disease is very different than the biological side of infectious disease. And do you want to cover 
do you see this covering both of those or one of those? And I think, uh, Mark, you mentioned the epidemiology interest group or something else is forming somewhere else in the RDA as another group. Yeah. So how do those tie together? So that was one of the interesting things that for me, um, I'm coming from the biological side. And yeah. as I mentioned, even the biological side of sharing immunology data with the actual comparing that to the genome of the how the virus is changing is just challenging on the biology side just in and of itself yeah um, so i mean one of you know to use the agriculture data group as an example um they will often have a one or two day pre-rda workshop because it allows them to focus in on that interest in agricultural data and they may have concurrent or you know uh, other ways of approaching their schedule but you know there's the wheat interoperability group and the rice interoperability group that's looking at metadata standards for describing research uh, on wheat uh, and rice and then there's other higher level groups that are looking at particular types of uh, standards or best practices that are of particular interest in the agricultural context. So I think it would be, to my mind, the community of practice provides a best case scenario where a group of individuals from all the perspectives, biological, you know, epidemiological, clinical, as we saw with COVID-19, legal and ethical, can, can consider the broad umbrella of infectious disease like we did for the COVID-19 exercise, both in those kind of safe zones where people are talking the same language and same interests and you know metadata standards for data repositories, but at the same time, they're able to bring that up in a more efficient and effective mechanism to a broader conversation about an infectious disease writ large. So, it, so having a community of practice for something as broad as infectious disease doesn't limit the opportunity to have a specific working group that is focused solely on immunological data, for example. But again, I think the conversation is happening, happening in, a, in the context of a higher level coordination, which I think is the part that, that in particular interests us. Claire, I think you were gonna say something. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, just chatting with Rajini, my co-chair uh, on the uh, new EPI group. Um, the, um, the new EPI uh, common standard um, for re uh, reporting surveillance data work group um, is not yet endorsed. Uh, but we do have a uh, draft case statement, which is presently in community review. Um, we're working on a, uh, a, new, a new version, an updated version of it, but I put in the chat there a link to the, the, the uh, work group on the RDA page. And if you scroll down, you'll find the link to the case uh, statement. Um, and I, I would, uh, very much welcome uh, people's comments on the case statement, and that might be the that that might be the opportunity also uh, for people to identify uh, where um, this group, whether it whether it, it becomes an interest group or a um, community of practice or another working group, where the intersection lies. Um, there, there may be, um, we might also want to think about whether or not uh, with, the, with the new uh, EPI uh, common data standard working group, uh, if we want to create uh, sub, uh, subgroups that would focus on particular aspects that um, may be highlighted um, in, um, in this uh, discussion here. Um, I think that I, I, I don't see overlap. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't see that the two groups or the, the way it's been articulated so far that um, we are uh, duplicating effort. Uh, uh, but I, I do see 
uh, uh, the need to uh, keep our activities very closely aligned. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the thing about a, a working group is that once you start, once you create a working group, um, and then your case 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 statement goes for uh, out for for public review, and then um, and then uh, is reviewed by TAB, and the work group is endorsed. Well, then the clock starts ticking. Now you have eighteen months uh, to come up with a deliverable. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really important to uh, plan carefully exactly what that deliverable is going to be. So just maybe taking that as a segue to our last few minutes, because we're five minutes before the half hour and the end of the session. Um, one of the takeaways I wanted to make sure we had was if there are any people on the call who might be interested in engaging in a conversation about uh, drafting up a charter for let's assume a community of practice and then it will evolve either in that direction or into an interest group context from there. Um, so I did wanna make sure that people had an opportunity to indicate whether they would like to continue to be involved in moving forward from Priyanka's idea for a, a birds of a feather uh, to see if there's interest in continuing the conversation and getting involved in a in an effort to describe what a community of practice for infectious disease might look like. And Priyanka, were you gonna say something? Um, I'm quite keen to put together a charter. I think if that, that helps move the discussion forward, if we don't get, um, if people are not sure yet what, what exactly the platform would look like. So defining um, the goal and objectives and what the aim is and how the community of practice as an umbrella or mm -hmm. a framework would enable other forms of outputs and enable other forms of work and pathways. Yeah. I can put together that chart and if that helps people decide and distribute it um, on the collaborative notes and then send it through to the, the attendees of this workshop. Okay. So Priyanka is offering to pull together a charter and all as somebody on council who's been working on the framework for communities of practice. I'll work with uh, uh, Priyanka to help uh, pull that together. And I see Alex has indicated a, a thumbs up. So we will let everybody know as that moves forward because we have your contact info. Is there anybody again on the call who would be interested in working up front with Priyanka and myself on, the, on pulling together community of practice? Uh, just to get, make sure everybody has an opportunity to to learn more about how that stuff works. Okay. I'm 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 very interested in the project. I but it's my second time working with like joining the RDA meeting, so I'm not so sure how to. But I would I I would be happy to help. Okay. That's great. Thanks, uh, Hojin. And I would say that the the best way as a newcomer or um, somebody who hasn't been to a lot of RDAs to get involved and understand how it works is to get involved in something like this. So I think what we'll do then is I'll just take uh, the three of us and uh, take that opportunity to to get it. Once I get a signal from Priyanka that she's uh, her schedule allows her to kind of think about this once this RDA week is done, then I'll reach out to uh, to Priyanka and Hua Jin just to arrange for a, an initial call. And then what will come from that uh, group of three exercise is a draft charter that will go to this entire group uh, to get feedback and pr almost probably have a subsequent call uh, to discuss the details and how we move that forward. And then what I will do on the other side of that is I will inform RDA council uh, that there's a, an interest emerging in, in defining a community of practice around infectious disease uh, so that they're aware that this is um, is moving ahead. So just I'll make sure we cover off the, the work of this group as well as uh, behind the scenes to alert council that this kind of uh, action will be coming. Mark, it's Claire. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, include me on that group of three, make it a group of four of um, to uh, just 
so that we can coordinate uh, with the um, the EPI working group um, and you know keep it aligned from from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I will do that, Claire. Um, and Rob, your suggestion is, I think, is tying this into the larger COVID-19 working group discussion. Yeah. Um, so Rob's referring to the COVID-19 working group session, which is taking place tomorrow. Um, so I'll be having uh, inserting this into that conversation because I'm working with a couple of colleagues and co-chairing that uh, that uh, session tomorrow. Uh, so we'll bring that to the conversation because one of the core takeaways from that COVID-19 working group session is how does this work continue? So it will either continue along the lines of what Claire has highlighted or it will kind of evolve into or part of this community of practice context or it will be something different. So. Uh, it's all I, I would say. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Can I ask a beginner's question? Mm -hmm. um, I've seen many task groups and working groups in Tadwig and in GBIF and so on. And I think in when it comes to open data and the kind of thinking together about the best ways, they uh, the the activity is basically. Uh, fall into two categories. Uh, some are about the better processes, like discussing better standards, better platforms, system to system solutions. And I sense that this is uh, closer to what RDA typically does. Again, this is my first time. So sorry if I'm asking something very stupid. And the other activities, they are more kind of, um, they are driven by particular needs and data hungers, data gaps, and and uh, uh, so they are more content oriented. So so they're more like utilizing whatever data solutions we have at hand, and then let's get the content out for for, for the particular need. So they are not driven by the data opportunities. We have the data. Let's make it open. But they are driven by a data hunger, so they satisfy the particular need. And I'm a little bit lost. What is the mission of the of the of the of the group you're you're forming now? Could you please say a few words about that? Uh, well, I think it can potentially serve both contexts. If I get you understand you correctly, Dimitri, you're in the GBIF and Tedwig context, which I've participated in as well. That's a very focused conversation around particular existing or if, if the necessary, the need for new standards and best practices. So RDA conversations can also go in that direction, typically in the context of a working group, uh, as Claire highlighted, where I have a specific need that's driving a requirement for an output that will help drive best practices in the community. And then there's that overall broader uh, social platform context of facilitating the conversation, coordinating the conversation, making sure the links between the different disciplinary communities are maintained, known, um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think to my mind, the simple answer is it can, can evolve into both. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Priyanka, I'm going to leave it to you because it probably went on a little long there. So I'm going to leave it to you for, and or Natalie for final comments. Um, I'll keep it short. I think um, even with a smaller group, we I feel like we achieved quite a bit in 90 minutes and we're looking at a way forward. Um, and I'm very keen to engage with this group again once the charter, the draft charter is, is put together um, and also get in touch with people who've expressed interest to be involved um, and then see where this goes. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your valuable inputs. Um, this has been really good. Natalie? No, I have nothing to add. That, that was perfectly well said. Thank you for this. Okay, so we'll be in touch with the larger group, but I'll, I'll also be in touch with uh, Hua Jin, Claire and Priyanka, uh, once Priyanka and I have a chance to, to get uh, through the RDA week and uh, we'll set up a, a call to uh, talk about the charter context in more detail. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent Thanks. meeting. Thanks. Bye.